Cool. All right. We'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight. We have a wonderful, awesome, exciting presentation ahead uh, titled Basic to Basics to Bi Biologics, Selecting Drops for Dry Eye. And that's with Dr. Mania and uh, Dr. Mania Madan. I'm just going to practice that. And then Dr. Mark Eltis. So I am your host tonight, Dr. Ariel Serenzi. And then I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Madan. She practices in Vancouver uh, at a Vancouver Eye Doctor, and she's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and frequently speaks on the use of innovative treatments for advanced dry eye disease, such as PRP and IPL. She and her team developed the technique to make PRP eye drops in her Vancouver clinic, and she also serves as the president for the BC Doctors of Optometry. And then Dr. Mark Eltis, he has practice on the West Coast and the East Coast. What's your favorite coast? Oh, the West Coast for sure. Oh, boo. <laughs> uh, he is a graduate of the University of Waterloo School of Optometry and has taught there for over a decade. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomat for the American Board of Optometry, and has also been an examiner for the National Lysing Assessment in uh, Canada and the U.S., He's published internationally and sought out as an expert for optometric issues for national TV and print. Um, he has been honored as a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and he's also on the board of directors for several optometric associations and organizations and a residency site evaluator for the ACOE. Uh, what do you not do, Mark? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that, uh, that's making me look way better than I am, but I appreciate it. <laughs> great, great photo too. So we're excited to hear from you too. And I'll go ahead and let you guys take it away. Thank you very much, Ariel. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm really excited. These are my disclosures. I don't think anything particularly relevant to what we'll be speaking about tonight. So um, it's our pleasure to be with you. And uh, here we go. So it's kind of interesting for me to be speaking about uh, drops because I spend half my day telling patients that if they wanna deal with the underlying cause of dry eye, then they have to do more than drops. So just as a disclaimer, cause I know everybody's thinking this, of course, the underlying issue with blepharitis and MGD is inflammation. And that's what we're dealing with mostly. And we like to deal with the root cause. However, of course, artificial tears still play a pivotal role in managing the condition. And of course, when patients come in, that's probably the first thing they're thinking about or the first thing they've tried. So uh, drops provide symptomatic relief to patients and that's why they obviously wanna use them. And especially during flare-ups, they're particularly relevant. Now, the first thing uh, when I tell patients about drops is uh, one of the most common things to get wrong, aside from using drops that aren't so great that it probably uh, start with a V, um, is to use the drops like a lip balm. So what do I mean by that? Uh, especially on the East Coast and Northeast where it's freezing, people really identify with that because in the winter when you're using a lip balm, if you wait till your lips are chapped, it's already too late. So I tell them artificial tears are just like a lip balm. You have to keep using it and use it before you have the symptoms. Once your lips are cracked, it's already too late. You have to build up that protection and that, that cut the lip balm just won't deal with. So they shouldn't wait until they're symptomatic or until the ocular surface is compromised. And unfortunately, a lot of times when we see them, that's already happened. Now, dry eye disease is non-binary. It can't easily be categorized as evaporative or aqueous deficient. In fact, the DUES2 study found that up to 70% of sufferers have a mix of the two. And of course, seeing uh, blepharitis and MGD and, and working on it for uh, you know, over a decade now as an area of interest, even MGD and blepharitis um, isn't, you know, in one uh, category or the other. It's usually a mix of the two. So even with dry eye, we're dealing with a multifactorial disease. So artificial tears can provide more than just symptomatic relief. And that's why it's important to know the ingredients. Uh, so it can reduce inflammation if you pick the right one and help prevent epithelial cell death. Now, when chosen carefully, eye drops can play a significant role in the management of dryness. So of course, we talk about warm compresses, we talk about um, you know the wipes, whatever they may be, and then in-office treatments, but 
the dry eye drops will give some relief initially and they play a role throughout the disease. Now, if you think it's overwhelming for a doctor to know the different types of drops, imagine what it's like to be a patient and you walk into the pharmacy and you see a counter full of drops. There must be over a hundred products. It's absolutely overwhelming. It's mind boggling. How would you even start to know which one is best? You probably just look at the prices or see which cover you like or which one's on sale. And of course, that's not the best way to pick a drop. So in terms of eye drops uh, over the counter, I still think of it as a prescription. I tell them exactly what I think they should use. I write it down. I tell them how to dose it, just like we would for a prescription medication. So that they know it's serious and it matters how they use it and when they use it. So let's go through some of our favorite drops. And of course, these aren't the only drops that are wonderful. There's many other products. We just don't have time for all of them. And I've tried to give uh, a taste of different categories and explain some differences between them. Um, so we'll clarify which are the most appropriate in which situations. And we'll also simplify when to turn to biologics. Now, preservatives are a necessary evil in multi-dose bottles. Pres preservatives contain bacterial replication. They minimize contamination. However, there's a really nasty side to them. They're counterproductive to the condition we're treating. In fact, some of them, which I'll speak about shortly, actually cause dry eye. And if nothing else, they're irritants that can be introduced to a compromised tear film and an ocular surface. So it's kind of like, imagine that the lip balm had sandpaper as one of the ingredients or an exfoliant when you were already dry. That wouldn't work very well, would it? So preservative free formulations are generally superior. They're highly recommended for those using drops more than four times a day. We used to say six, you know, I, I've been practicing for almost 20 years, so I'm a dinosaur, as I, I love to say. Um, so I remember when we'd say four, six times a day or eight times a day. Now we say if it's over four times a day, you should be in a preservative free formulation. Now, BAK and thimerosal should be avoided at all costs. Now, again, uh, thimerosal, we all know, you know, even if we've been practice for decades, but what about BAK? Well, it was introduced in a lot of drops that were used for dry eye and uh, let alone for, uh, you know, medications for other reasons for uh, um, eye conditions. Now, BAK not only uh, causes dry eye, it also can uh, interfere with the trabecular meshwork, cause degeneration, and also can degrade mitochondria. So bad news all around should be avoided. In terms of selecting viscosity, this is something that I like to go through the patient. Now there are objective ways of determining it and subjective ways. We can uh, speak about the tear osmolarity and um, you know, kind of gauge ourselves from there. I use the eye pen in the office to gauge osmolarity and kind of go from there. But I also like to ask patients, do you mind a thicker drop? because some patients have preferences, regardless of where they are on the dry eye disease spectrum, they may just not like thicker drops. So if it's a question of them using something or not, I'd rather have something that they like. So obviously when you get deeper into dry disease, you probably need a thicker drop, but as viscosity increases, the duration of effect also increases. So that makes sense. And um, personally, I actually like thicker drops and I'm not a advanced dry disease patient. I just feel it lasts longer and I'm kind of lazy. So I like the idea of putting it in and not having to put it in uh, for a while. But when you increase viscosity, so does the potential for blurred vision. So you have to be kind of careful with that and uh, speak to the patient about that possibility. Now let's start with uh, the first drop we're gonna be talking about, sustained ultra hydration. It's a relatively inexpensive drop an effective option for mild to moderate dry disease. Now, I happen to work in a uh, fairly affluent area in Toronto. We kind of call it like Rodeo Drive of uh, Canada, or at least in Toronto. And obviously a lot of the patients uh, don't have an issue with uh, you know, paying for a premium product. However, I'm not delusional. Obviously in most of North America, people would like to go for a more economical option. I find this drop really uh, works. It's a uh, good bang for your buck. It's got moderate viscosity too. So it's, it's kind of not the thinnest drop and not the thickest. So it's really an all season tire for me for dry eye disease. And it's got the coating power of hyaluronic. It also has a unique ingredient, HP Guar, which forms a gel layer acting as a mucomimetic. 
and uh, compensating for a compromised tear film and reducing friction with blinks. In fact, it interacts with the blinking motion to increase the contact time on the eye. The HP guar molecules bind to compromised areas of the cornea. Now, if you wanna to go to the next level, it's easier if the patient already knows the product and they've used it and they trust it. It's an, it's an easier step or transition to talk them into a non-preserved option of a brand they've already used. So it's great that Sustain Ultra also comes in a single dose, non-preserved option. Obviously it's more expensive, but if patients are familiar with the brand, I think it's an easier transition. And as we mentioned earlier, it's highly recommended if they're using it more than four times a day. Now, Hilo Dual Intense is kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of price. It's a premium multi-dose preservative free option for more advanced dry eye. To tell you the truth, I use it in even in uh, moderate dry eye or even early dry eye, just because I find it effective and uh, it's one of my absolute favorites. Uh, the unique multi-dose pump doesn't allow air to penetrate the interior. It's, you really have to talk to patients about this because the pump is totally different. It's not a squeeze pump. It's, uh, you press the, uh, the back of it. And in fact, you have to press it a few times before the first drop comes out. So a lot of patients will say, hey, you sold me a defective bottle, nothing came out, so I didn't use it. Now, this unique uh, bottle is safe to use for up to six months once opened. So that's very different from the pharmacy drops, which usually say you have to discard after a month, which of course patients don't know, so you really have to mention this to them. Um, and you have to talk about how to use this particular uh, pumping mechanism. Now, some patients find it easier, but obviously some patients who are older who may have some arthritic conditions or other conditions may find it more challenging. Now, when compared head to head with a single dose non-preserved option, this product becomes more, you know, more affordable if you think about it. If it's got 300 drops in the bottle, well, how much would 300 single dose vials cost you or the patient for that matter? Now, it's got a higher level of viscosity. Uh, produced by a high concentration of heavier weight uh, hyaluronate. And although that's true, I don't find it blurs vision. So I, I put it in, you know, I've, now you're not supposed to use it with contacts. I will admit I've cheated and used it with contacts and it feels fine, but uh, obviously don't recommend it for contact lenses, but all to say that I don't think it blurs out vision and certainly isn't greasy. Now it contains something called ectoine, which is a natural anti-allergy and anti-inflammatory agent. It's effective in patients suffering from dry disease and allergic conjunctivitis. So obviously this is great for uh, patients who are also itching. I find it really coats the eye. And as we know, patients with a dry disease have secondary allergic conjunctivitis. So this kind of hits two birds with one stone. It's also been shown to be effective in accelerating wound healing post-surgically. So that's um, definitely a plus. Now switching gears to uh, Thalo's dual gel, it's a single unit preservative free thicker gel. Now this is actually probably my favorite gel right now. I used it during a flare up I had uh, about two years ago. Um, I had a really nasty dry flare up. And at night I found it was better for me than most of the ointments. Uh, it's an excellent bedtime option. It didn't blur vision at all for me and it's not oily, um, but it's, it's, you can feel the heaviness. So there is a, a thickness viscosity to it, which is really great. It's got treolose, which is an osmoprotectant. It's designed to guard epithelial cells and stabilize membranes. And in fact, treolose protects against the destructive inflammatory cascade of dry disease. So you can think of it as, an, as a natural um, anti-inflammatory. Now, obviously some dry disease patients will come in where they're too far gone, need to use a steroid or something else. But uh, if I can control the inflammation with a natural product or avoid steroids or other drugs, this is a go-to for me. Now, uh, sodium hyaluronate, which also uh, is included in the gel, en enhances viscosity, and carbomer increases viscosity as well. And in fact, the carbomer holds everything together. It kind of binds the hyaluronate and the trailos together in contact with the ocular surface for up to six hours, and it's not sticky. Now, um, the single unit dose nature of the product does make it a more expensive option, but I think especially if you're using it for flare-ups, it makes a lot of sense. So usually if patients buy one of these, if they're having a flare-up, you know, that's 10 nights, that should do the trick. And obviously if they need to use it more regularly, it's also wonderful. Now there is a drop as well. Um, 
still is duo drop and the ingredients are the same minus the carbomer, which again, remember it's kind of increasing viscosity and putting everything together. So this is a, a more fluid uh, version of the um, product. It's preservative free and it's also good for three months once opening. So again, this is a longer duration than a lot of the pharmacy drops that we have. And it's also more moderately priced than the high-low line. So definitely, you know, if you're looking for an in-between option, this would be it. Now, Calmo Spray is a unique product uh, for NGD, but I use it for other dry patients as well. It's preservative-free. It's good for six months once open, and it can be used, interestingly enough, with the eyes closed. So uh, it actually seeps in and tries to replicate the natural meibomian gland secretions uh, using liposomes. And basically it's seeping in gently. So we're kind of creating a uh, artificial myba. Now it's an excellent option for people who hate putting in drops into their eyes. Now I know it doesn't uh, you know, replace uh, an artificial tear in all its forms, but it's something. Some patients who absolutely can't handle drops in kids sometimes, if they have some minor irritation and they don't want to use drops, this is a wonderful option. And it's got provitamin B5, which moisturizes the eye and the surrounding skin. Now, Optase Dual Pilo Night, which is also known as Ocunox, is a nighttime ointment that uses vitamin A to speed up epithelial healing. Now, there is some controversy with vitamin A. I can only say that when I use it in the office, it works really well. Uh, patients like it. It's uh, simple. They also, uh, if you've used it in the past, it had this ring that when you open the bottle, uh, it had this uh, you know, ring that would fall off and I was always afraid it would fall into the patient's eyes. They've removed that, so it's no longer an issue. It's preservative free, it's phosphate free. Uh, it's a little bit oily, so there is that to it. I definitely uh, would warn patients, especially if their contact lens wears about it, or if for whatever reason uh, they don't like oily products, there is some oily, oiliness to it, but it's not greasy. So it's, it's a moderate uh, ointment. If someone's having some dry issues or a flare up, it's not uh, you know, the thickest one available, but it's also got some substance to it. So it'll last for a while, hopefully throughout the night. In terms of blur, I wouldn't say there's absolutely no blur, but you can absolutely function. It's not gonna interfere if someone still wants to walk around after they've put in the drops. Now, speaking of very thick, Lacry Lube is the absolute uh, mother of all thick nighttime ointments. It's got mineral oil base that allows melting at body temperature and white petroleum, which serves as a lubricant. Now, patients need to be warned if they're gonna use this in both eyes, they will be blurred out. So that's gonna happen for a sustained duration. So ideally, if they're gonna use this product in both eyes, they should already be sitting in bed when inserting it um, you know, for their safety and so that they're not alarmed. Now I use this um, for lack of thalamus patients. Um, I use this if there's been some corneal abrasion uh, or in more severe dry eye. Uh, definitely it's the go-to for me if I need some serious coating power. Now, uh, my mom would kill me if I didn't mention a liposic because uh, she's been on it for a very long time. It's a reasonably priced option for decades. Uh, MGD patients don't always respond best to oil replenishment drops. So I'm not a firm believer in kind of dividing it, you know, for MGD patients or blepharitis patients or other patients. As I mentioned earlier, it's a non-binary disease, but this particular product has endured in both drop and ointment form uh, for a while. And I find, you know, uh, not to give um, Bosch and Lom a, a lot of uh, free advertising, but it's like when uh, people are in Bosch and Lom multifocal contacts, you can't just get them out of it. It's the same thing with this drop. They're very loyal to it. And um, a lot of ophthalmologists use it as well. Now, the, in terms of its ingredients, I'm not going to read them all out, but it's got carbomer and some of the other um, you know, ingredients like uh, medium chain triglycerides. Um, the lipstick gel has sodium hydroxide. So this is the, the nighttime version, which closely mirrors the pH of tears at 7.4. And it attempts to replicate all three tear layers. Now, switching gears to refresh Optive Mega 3, it's a single dose preservative free drop. It contains omega-3 as the name would suggest from flaxseed oil. Now studies show that eye drops using emollients can increase lipid layer thickness of the tear film. 
And omega-3 fatty acids, interestingly enough, are actually found in the normal tear layer, which now kind of makes sense when you're recommending omega-3, omega oh, it's actually a component of the tears. Now, this product is formulated to minimize blur, and it doesn't require shaking. And it's designed to re replenish uh, all three tear layers. And it's targeted towards MDD patients, as, uh, as you would imagine, like sustain complete and retain. Now, these drops may be more helpful for patients with prolonged screen time. Honestly, these days, that's uh, all of us. Um, but basically, it's a lifestyle that decreases blinking and myvum secretion. And this is probably a good time for me to mention that that's something you have to tell your patients too, that drops are not the uh, kind of only solution to their problem. And of course we know about the other um, at home options, but what I mean is that if they're gonna continue to look at the screen without blinking, if they're gonna use you know, a fan in the middle of the night that blows on them and it's drying out their eyes, or uh, they're not gonna use a humidifier, the drops alone won't help. It's like going to a podiatrist and then you know, running marathons in high heels. It's just not gonna work. Now, um, the lubricants in this um, product are uh, glycerin and uh, CMC and uh, polysorbate. So in conclusion to this section, there are many uh, excellent products on the market for dry disease. There's no magic formula or perfect drop for every patient. A careful case history can help. You gotta listen to the patient, what they're comfortable using, because even if you give them the best product, if it's something they're uncomfortable with, like an oily product or a gel they don't like, or they're not great with fumbling with single uh, unit drops, they're not gonna use it, it doesn't work. So there will be some trial and error in finding the right combination of products. Both doctor and patient need to understand this and work together. And my best piece of advice for you, try out the products yourself. There's just little subtleties in each product they just don't know until you try it. I wouldn't know about that cap, you know, for instance, when the old Aquinox, uh, you wouldn't know, um, you know, how the uh, pump works in another product if you don't try it. So it really helps you connect with the patient and know the challenges that they may have when using the drops. So that's uh, it for my part. This was kind of a summary of the basics. Now on to more advanced stuff with uh, Mania, who I always say knows more than me. Thank you, Mark. That was excellent. It's uh, wonderful to see um, so many different um, you know, lubricating eye drops out on the market now uh, that are not just uh, they're sup you know supplementing the tear film, but actually have properties that help um, you know reduce inflammation, which is like you said, is at the core of dry eye disease. So I'm super excited to be here, you guys, and I'm going to be talking about how do we transition into biologics and where do they fit into our dry eye algorithm? Um, you know, there are also drops in the biologics arena. And so how do we transition from artificial tears to um, the biologics area? So now to transition into that, I'd like to start off with the case. Uh, so shake things up a little bit. This was a patient that was referred to me for dry eye management. Um, she reports that her eyes burn all the time. They're red. You know, she has that sandy gravel feeling in her eyes. Nothing new. We definitely do hear, um, you know, our patients report these signs. She's an interior decorator. So she spends a fair bit of time on the computer and she is putting drops in her eyes, you know, all the time. Her husband accompanied her to, um, to this appointment and both of them were very kind of anxious and how dry eye disease, you know, is impacting the quality of their life. She says, you know, she can't use the computer for as long as she used to be able to. Now, currently she's already on Thielos Duo Drops, um, the gel formation, uh, you know, for that highly viscosi uh, viscosity that Dr. Mark um, Altas discussed. She's already on Zydra as well, using that twice a day. She's on omega-3 hot compresses. And then she also reports to wearing moisture goggles when she's out for a walk with her dog as the air really bothers her eyes. In her history, um, she said that she does have Sjogren's syndrome um, for the last five years. And, uh, you know, she's a breast cancer survivor and also has um, sarcoidosis, but she's never needed treatment for, for that disease. So lots going on in this patient, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sure lots of us can relate when patients are on lubricating drops, they're using hot compresses and omega-3s, you know, where do we kind of go from here? So this is what her ocular surface looks like. 
being a Sjogren uh, patient, of course, we do expect some corneal staining and some conjunctival staining. So you and I can both see that there. And of course, we'd want to look at meibomian glands. And this is what her glands looked like. There was some shortening of those meibomian glands, but overall, not too bad. So now as a side note on uh, Sjogren's syndrome, now we've always thought of Sjogren's as an aqueous deficient dry eye, right? Due to the lack of the inability for the lacrimal gland to produce good quality tears. But it turns out that now newer studies are showing that patients that have Sjogren's also have greater loss of meibomian glands. So they also have this evaporative component to their dry eye disease. So it's very, very important to, uh, you know, make sure that you check for um, meibomian glands in all of your Sjogren's uh, patients, because that can be very significant. And as this um, disease progresses, you know, this, this can cause severe, you know, dry eye and, and also impact vision. So uh, this was interesting. Uh, this was a survey that was done by the Sjogren's Foundation. They surveyed 300 adults. And what they found was that dry eye was the most activity limiting aspect of Sjogren's disease. Now, this really kind of surprised me because um, Sjogren's as you know, is a, is a multi kind of a organ disease. Patients have, you know, nervous system is affected. They have this debilitating pain, their kidneys and their liver function can be affected. But what they found was that dry eye was the most activity limiting aspect. And not only was dry eye activity limiting, but also the financial burden of treating dry eye disease, uh, you know, increased anxiety and reduced quality of life for these patients. I recently had a patient that told me um, who has shown that she goes through three bottles of, uh, you know, Optase gel um, per month. And, and you're looking at, you know, a cost of, uh, you know, $150 to $180, not accounting for any prescription medications that this patient might be using on. So the impact is real. Our patients are telling us that as well. Now, we've all seen this definition of dry eye disease, right? It's a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film. Now I'm going to actually have you emphasize on the word tear film. So it is loss of homeostasis, not of the conjunctiva, not of the cornea, not of the lids, but loss of homeostasis of the tear film that leads us you know, to have this disease that now impacts the ocular surface, impacts patients' quality of life, having them complain of pain, blur, and spending lots of money to try to fix this. So what is so important about this tear film that the loss of it is, the loss of homeostasis of this tear film is, is causing a disease, right? So really something to think about. Now, all of the dry eye treatments, now this is put forth by, you know, the dues too, is a systematic approach to treating dry eye disease. And at the core of it, as Dr. Eltis had alluded, is treating inflammation, is managing inflammation to restore the homeostasis of the tear film. So everything in this treatment plan, uh, you know, the purpose of it is to restore homeostasis of the tear film, to help manage inflammation at different levels because it is a multifactorial condition. And today, of course, of course, we are talking about blood biologics and, you know, how do they contribute to um, the balance of the tear film? How do they restore the homeostasis in that amazing tear film, uh, you know, that, that we see in the definition of dry eye disease? So here we are. How do we get started in this blood biologics? Well, it turns out that um, the first reference of blood use in the eye was back in 1534. And if anybody can read Egyptian, it's written right over there. Uh, this is where uh, there's a mention of blood use in the eye. Fast forward to 1975, Ralph and his colleagues used it in dry eye. In fact, he actually told his patients to cut their finger and squeeze a little bit of blood in their eye to help treat their dry eyes. And then in 1984, it was the first time we saw the use of autologous serum as, uh, you know, as treatment for dry eye disease. Now we've come a long way from there. Now we see so many blood biologics in the mix. Um, there's autologous serum, there's platelet-rich plasma, there's PRGF, and all of these can get a little bit confusing. And I will, you know, try my best to kind of simplify this today. But what's really important to remember uh, with this is that they're all made from patients' own blood. 
after we centrifuge it and we get rid of uh, our RBCs. And really the main difference between all of these products is the amount of growth factors that it contains. Okay, so it's the amount of growth factors. Some of them, depending on how they're processed, contain more growth factors. Some of them contain less growth factors. Now, in almost every form of dry eye disease, we know a lubricating drop is needed. And again, Dr. Alt Malt- uh, has talked about that. But what is a good dry eye drop, right? Uh, there's been so many attempts made to lubricate the ocular surface uh, that mimic the tear film. And that's always been our goal is to mimic that tear film, you know, to find things that are within our tear film so that we can mimic it in, in, in hopes to rest- restore that homeostasis. Now, we've been able to match a few things in our artificial tears. Um, Um, We've been able to match preservative free formularies, maybe add some anti inflammatory formularies. Maybe we've been able to match the pH of our tear film to in in some of these uh, lubricating drops. But what is so amazing about our own tear film that we are just not able to find in over the counter lubricating drops? Well, it turns out that the human tear actually contains 1800 different known molecules. Now this was actually from TFOS DUCE 2 in 2017. I wouldn't be surprised if this number has gone up. Um, And together these molecules work very hard to protect the ocular surface. They form the most perfect lubricant. They have antimicrobial activities. They have anti-inflammatory activities. Together they help nourish the cornea, maintain the clarity of the cornea. But here's a really special word, and this is what really sets this tear film apart, is that our natural tear film is actually epitheliotropic, which means that it can support proliferation, migration, differentiation of corneal and conjunctival cells. Now, that's something not a lot of uh, lubricating drops are able to do, and that's what really sets it apart. So now let's jump back to blood biologics and and why they make sense. So what is PRP? Well, if you remember from your biology class, our blood contains several elements. We've got red blood cells in our blood, which make up about 41% of, of the, um, of the volume of the blood. And we've got white blood cells, you know, the leukocytes and lymphocytes and neutrophils, and they make up about 4%. Now, less than 1% composition of our blood is actually platelets. And the rest of the volume, the clear liquid that makes up the rest of our blood is plasma, which is about 55%. So what PRP is, is basically getting rid of all of the other cells in our blood and just keeping platelets in plasma. So platelet rich plasma, right? So PRP uh, contains three to five times the concentration of platelets than we would find in whole blood. But why platelets? What is so special about platelets? Well, it turns out that this tiny guy um, is considered the powerhouses for healing. Our platelets contain over 800 different molecules, you know, that are released at the site of tissue damage. And they not only form the clotting cascade, which we learned in school, right? If we cut ourselves, platelets come there and release uh, clotting cascades to clot the blood, but they also have many, many healing agents that come to the site of damage and help to restore tissue function, accelerate healing. And they do this by releasing growth factors. Okay, so they do this by releasing growth factors. And so here are a list of growth factors that are found in our platelets. And these growth factors are just fascinating. And really, what is a growth factor? Well, as the name suggests, a growth factor is a factor that tells our cells to grow. And that is what a growth factor does. So here's an example of some of the growth factors in platelets. There's platelet derived growth factor. Well, as you can see, it helps the cells grow, new generation repair of blood vessels, collagen production. There's epithelial growth factor, which causes promotion of epithelial cells, angiogenesis. There's also uh, transforming growth factor beta. This helps with epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and promotion of wound healing. And so this is what really sets uh, the blood biologics apart are, are these growth factors that are carried within our blood and can be used. Now, it turns out that plasma is not any, you know, uh, is also full of tons of proteins and immunoglobulins and electrolytes that fight infection and maintain cellular function. Plasma also contains 600 different molecules that support cellular healing. 
one very important protein that's found in plasma is called albumin. And albumin helps reduce the degradation of growth factors at the site of injury so that those growth factors can last longer and, and do what, they're, what they need to be doing. Now, when we put these two powerhouses together, we put platelet with plasma together, we get this liquid, which is just fascinating. It contains growth factors, which are epitheliotropic, right? They can support proliferation, migration, and differentiation of corneal and conjunctival cells. PRP contains vitamins, fibronectin, cytokines, which are anti-inflammatory and also act as natural analgesics. And they also contain immunoglobulins and clotting factors to help heal the, um, you know, the, the site of damage. Now, when we go ahead and compare what is found in tears and what is found in PR PRP, it's actually very fascinating. You can see that the osmolarity is similar in both of those liquids. pH is very similar in both of those liquids. Not a big deal, because we can also found that in over-the-counter lubricating drops. But here um, in tears, we do find a whole lot of immunoglobulins that are there to fight infections to make sure that our, our ocular surface remains free of uh, any infections. And we can also see those immunoglobulins in PRP as well. Here's a set of growth factors that are found in our tears, and you can also see them in PRP. On top of that, we also find electrolytes that are found in tears and are also found in PRP. Now let's talk about the preparation of, uh, of autologous serum and of course of PRP, just so that we know when we're prescribing to our patients, well, wh why does this make sense, you know, and, and what would I choose and, and which direction should I be going in? So autologous serum, um, you know, of course, we start with a blood draw from the patient. And what we do with that blood draw is we clot that blood. Okay. So autologous serum uses clotted blood to make autologous serum eye drops for patients. So when the blood is clotted, remember what happens in the clotting cascade is that platelets are asked, are activated. They release their content. Okay. Once the platelets break open, they release their content, which is their growth factors and all those cytokines, which is what forms the serum layer of autologous serum. And now platelets also release this clotting fibrin, which then wraps around the red blood cells to prevent bleeding, right? And now when we centrifuge this, the platelets along with the RBCs and along with the white blood cells will kind of settle at the bottom. And what you'll be left at the top after centrifugation is the content of platelets floating in, um, you know, in this liquid, uh, which is part of the plasma. So that's what autologous serum looks like. Now, PRP, on the other hand, um, does not use clotted blood. In fact, once we do the blood draw from the patient, we actually want to prevent clotting altogether because we don't want to activate platelets. We want to keep the platelets in their true and natural form. So after, uh, and when we spin this, so we've taken the blood from the patient, we've added an anticoagulant to stop any clotting to occur. And so when we spin this, we get this separation of red blood cells and white blood cells and all these other components of blood that settle at the bottom. And you'll see in the test tube, it says red blood cells at the bottom. And you'll get this area of platelet rich plasma. And so this is where all the platelets are because they are not activated. So they're not kind of tangled with the RBCs. And on top of that, you get basically your natural uh, plasma. So this is really fascinating. Now, the difference between the two, if I were to write it down, here are some of the major differences between autologous serum and PRP. Autologous serum, you know, right off the bat, one of the biggest differences is that it does not contain platelets. And we can see that from the way that it's made because it uses clotted blood, the platelets just simply get filtered out of the process. And because platelets are the ones that carry growth factors, Filtering platelets out, you know, naturally just decreases the concentration of growth factors in autologous serum and also reduces plasma factors because some of those clotting factors that are or healing factors that are in plasma, when they get activated during clotting, they will also leave plasma and, and go settle down where the platelets are. It's th This is why it's important to note that serum is not plasma. Serum is the byproduct that's left over after clotting has occurred. Now, studies do show that autologous serum can contain inflammatory cytokines. And this, again, has to do with the clotting process, which activates monocytes and leukocytes to help fight infections. And, and, and those can um, you know, then introduce more inflammatory cytokines 
cytokines to the serum as well. Now, autologous serum does contain higher amounts of TGF beta. Now, this is a growth factor that is important um, and in reasonable quantities can help um, accelerate wound healing, but in very high quantities can su suppress wound healing, which is what we would not want on the ocular surface. And that is why we often find that um, autologous serum is diluted, right? Um, you may have seen it or have dispensed it to patients and you probably would dispense autologous serum 20%, which means it's 20% autologous serum and 80% saline, or you might dispense it at autologous serum 50%, which is 50% saline and then 50% autologous serum. But of course, if we're adding saline to this, we're further diluting the concentration of those amazing growth factors. Now, PRP, on the other hand, contains platelets. It has higher concentration of growth factors and plasma factors, right? Because those are carried within the platelets. And it is presumed that once platelets become active at the site of injury, whether it's the ocular surface or anywhere else in other cases of uh, medicine where platelet-rich plasma is used, that growth factors are released in a more biologically relevant ratio. There are also no inflammatory cytokines that we find in PRP, mainly because we have not started the, you know, the clotting process, uh, which activates a lot of these things. PRP is often not diluted. It is dispensed 100%. So we do not add saline to uh, PRP. There's no need for it. And for this reason, in many of the studies, it is considered superior to autologous serum because it contains a higher concentration of those growth factors. Now, PRP is also used widely in medicine. We've seen it used, um, being used in dentistry, in dermatology, those vampire facials that we hear about. And we don't really see autologous serum being used anywhere else except in eye care. Now, here was an interesting study that, um, you know, was found um, that compared autologous serum for patients with active Sjogren's syndrome versus uh, inactive secondary Sjogren's syndrome. And they found that patients that had had significantly higher expression of inflammatory cytokines were the patients that had active secondary Sjogren's uh, syndrome. And so this kind of goes to show that, you know, our, our, you know, our serum will be affected by this. And so there was clinical observation of poor response to autologous serum in patients with active secondary Sjogren's syndrome. Now, this was actually a really neat study that just hot off the press recently came out, um, actually on April 23rd, and it was published in the Ocular, um, Ocular Surface uh, Journal. This was a multi-center report that compared the use of platelet or plasma rich in growth factors, PRGF, for the treatment of patients with ocular surface disease in North America. Now, this was a study that, you know, the multi-centers that were included in it was Duke's Eye um, Institute, Baskin Palmer and Baylor College. So really big eye institute, you know, got together and said, hey, does PRP or PRGF really work? Let's find out. And now, so what is PRGF, you might ask? So it's very similar to PRP. So think that you're starting with PRP, we've got platelet-rich plasma, and those uh, platelets are not active in the test tube. Well, guess what? You can actually activate those platelets to release their content within that test tube. And when that happens, we get platelet rich or plasma rich growth factor. And that's what uh, PRGF is. And so this was an interesting study because they had 153 patients with various ocular surface disease. So not just dry eye, but they included patients that had corneal ulcers, perhaps neurotropic dry eye. They had patients uh, with you know, uh, persistent epithelial defects, patients with EBMD, and they also had patients with um, uh, limbic, uh, sorry, um, limbal cell deficiency there. And what they found was that there was an improvement noted in 76% of the patients. And that's huge. So that's, you know, uh, noticing at the slit lamp that there was an improvement in all those forms of dry eye uh, in 76% of the patients. Not only did the patients feel better, 
oh, sorry, not only did the doctors report that, um, that there was an improvement in the ocular surface, but the patients also uh, reported an imp improvement. At the start of the study, the average SAN score, which is similar to you know, your OSDI score or the speed score, was 90 out of 100. So that was at the start of the study. And so the average um, you know, after treatment dropped to 34 out of 100. So even patients felt better when they were using PRP, which is really fascinating. Now, here's another interesting study that uh, looked at confocal microscopy to look at corneal nerves in dry eye disease patients. We know that the cornea contains over 11,000 nerve endings per square millimeter, so it's highly innervated. Um, and it's highly sensitive. So this is what the first picture represents what a normal corneal nerve pattern would look like. Now, I know we're not doing a poll, but if you were to guess, um, you can see in the next two pictures that there's definitely some corneal nerve loss, perhaps more in picture C than in picture B. And so which condition, evaporative versus aqueous deficient dry eye, do you think would cause more loss in, in corneal nerve function? So I'll just give you one second to pick an answer. Is it evaporative or is it aqueous deficient that would cause more corneal nerve damage? Well, if you guessed aqueous deficient, then you are right because um, it is due to you know, an autoimmune link uh, that these patients are prone to a more severe type of dry eye, uh, which can result in corneal nerve loss. Now, this was a study that also showed use of PRP in the treatment to help improve confocal microscopy uh, and findings of corneal nerves. And so you can see that um, there is uh, perhaps evidence that increased corneal sub-basal nerve plexus density, suggesting a possible pathway to managing patients with corneal neuropathic pain. So who can benefit from blood biologics? I think we touched on that a little bit already in the study and the various uh, types of dry eye patients that were included in it. I find that I can use it for mild, moderate, or severe dry eye patients. I can use it for aqueous and evaporative because they're not independent of each other. I particularly find the use of blood biologics interesting um, and valuable in patients that have had LASIK or PRK and other uh, you know, ocular surgeries. I've also used it in patients with neuropathic and neurotropic uh, pain. And, you know, studies also support that. We've, we've seen some of the data with that. And also patients that have autoimmune diseases and perhaps patients that just want natural options and don't want to use a medication, this would be a good option for them. Now, here's, here was a study that showed, um, that looked at recurrent corneal erosions um, for and with the treatment of PRP. And what they found was that major recurrent corneal erosions reduced with PRP use from 23 to 7, and minor ones from 50 reduced to 10. So that's very significant as well. Now, this was a patient that I saw in my clinic, and we used PRP drops on this patient. Um, so she had really significant lid disease as well, and a floppy eyelid syndrome, and a heavy computer user. She would use steroids and things would get better, but as she would come off the steroids, things would bounce right back. And so in treating her lid disease, we also um, you know, used PRP on this patient and, and you know, really saw clearing of that corneal um, SPK, which was fascinating because it also improved her vision. Now back to our patient that's 51 years old. Well, this was my treatment plan for her. You know, so she's a Sjogren's patient. I mean, with Sjogren's, we're not going to get a get rid of every single, you know, corneal staining, every single SPK. But it's really important to reduce inflammation, to prevent damage, and to help to restore, uh, you know, balance in that tear film. And so she was a, quite a happy camper. And on the one of the last visits, she said to me. You know, sometimes I even forget to use my drops. Now, the access to PRP, you know, that's going to be our next question, or to autologous serum. We know that these drops work well. The studies have shown that, and you've seen the fascinating uh, results with growth factors. Well, how do we get our hands on them? And I am sorry to say that the you know access to them is limited. There are some companies around the U.S. 
um, like vital tears and compounding pharmacies that we can use to help prepare these. In some um, states, you can also implement perhaps a system in your own practice and make PRP and autologous serum in your own practice. We do that here in Vancouver. Um, each blood draw, you know, yields about a three month supply of PRP or autologous serum eye drops. And that may not be for everyone either, right? So we have to, you know, we have to be mindful of when we can use this um, because it's going to need a blood draw every three months if patients want to continue using this. And these drops also need to be refrigerated and used and need to be used very frequently, like four to six times a day, which can be, um, you know, not feasible for everyone. So now when, um, blood draw is not an option. There are some other blood biologic type drops on the market. One of them is amniotic fluid drops, and you might be familiar with them. There are a couple of companies called Stimulize uh, by M2 Biologics and Regenerize. And now these are made from donor human amniotic fluid or placental tissue. They also contain cytokines and growth factors. We don't know, you know, to the level of growth factors as compared to autologous or PRP, but there's definitely some growth factors, uh, you know, in amniotic fluid drops as well. And there are really no head to head studies right now that compare all of these different things as we're still really learning about this field of, um, of regenerative medicine. But they were found to reduce pain and inflammation and, and promote healing in patients that have had ocular chemical burns. So this would be a good option for patients uh, that don't want to do a blood draw. I know some of the optometrists in the United States can actually carry these drops in their clinics and sell them to the patients. Unfortunately, in Canada, we don't have access to them. It's not something we can carry in clinic, but patients can directly order from uh, these companies' websites and have access to them in Canada as well. Now, when we start talking about dry, advanced dry eye, I mean, we cannot not talk about neurotropic keratitis, right? So in very simple words, uh, neurotropic keratitis is a degenerative disease of the cornea due to the cornea's ability to heal, okay? As we already seen that corneal nerves play a very important role in the homeostasis and the balance of, um, of the ocular surface, our cornea is highly innervated, and then damage to these nerves leads to partial or total loss of corneal sensation, which can lead to healing defects um, and even perforation if, if, um, you know, if the cornea continues to thin. Um, so neurotropic keratitis is, is one of those classic stain, but no pain. So we see a lot of stuff going on in the cornea, but the patient says, hey, I really don't feel anything. Um, it is considered an orphan disease, which means it's rare, but when it's in your chair, it's not so rare and it's, it is difficult to manage. Um, and so many of the reasons, you know, why patients can have neurotropic keratitis. So, you know, in every dry eye patient, um, I don't suspect neurotropic keratitis, but I, you know, I do want to be mindful of it. If patients have had injuries or surgeries or infections, when there is especially herpes or herpes zoster in the past. And I do think it's a good idea to check for corneal sensitivity on, on every new dry eye assessment. And the way I check corneal sensitivity is I use a dental floss and I touch all the four quadrants of the cornea. And what I will record is that either corneal sensitivity is present, absent, or reduced. And that gives me a general idea of what I'm looking at before I treatment plan that patient. Now, for the treatment of neurotropic keratitis, we do have a drug that's available. It's called Oxervate under the, um, under the you know, the name is um, Synergimin, which is a recombinant nerve growth factor. So nerve growth factor is something that is produced by our corneal nerves, which helps promote corneal healing. So this is a recombinant nerve growth factor, which also does the same thing. It promotes corneal nerve healing in neurotropic uh, corneas. And so the results in the studies were very, very promising. Now, this has been available in the US since 2018, and we just got it in Canada in 2022. Um, and it can really improve, uh, you know, that corneal surface. Uh, and now Oxervate is also considered a orphan drug, which means it's treating something that is rare. And there is government assistance available for this drug as it can be quite expensive. Now, the last category of advanced kind of dry eye patients or patients that really puzzle us are these patients with neuropathic pain, right? So in the last case in the neurotropic keratitis, we saw that those patients had a lot going on in the cornea 
but their nerves were just not responding, right? So lots of stain, but no pain. Now these patients actually have very clean looking eyes, but their nerves are just not happy and they're constantly firing. So we know that in this um, type of dry eye, there is an insult to the pain signaling system. And that pain signaling system is constantly firing. Patients report of this heightened pain, burning, stinging, uh, eye ache, and that really extreme photophobia. When I hear patients complain of extreme photophobia, I'm really uh, in tune to looking for neuropathic pain in these patients. But when we look at the corneal findings or you know, we look at the ocular surface, we're not really finding anything significant. So pain is felt, not seen, but until now we do have confocal microscopy in patients that have neuropathic pain and, and confocal microscopy does show corneal tortuosity, beating and neuromas. And so these are all signs of damage to that pain signaling system where they can be really heightened. There are some other tests that we can also do in our clinical practice, like preparacaine test. If the pain completely goes away after I put a drop of preparacaine, I can say that perhaps that's, you know, the pain is located more in the peripheral nervous system, but if the pain doesn't go away, then it's located in the central nervous nervous system. Now, neuropathic pain, again, is very, very difficult to manage, and it really requires a multi-treatment approach on our part and a multidisciplinary uh, approach as well. We're working with other practitioners as well. Our key um, in this you know, condition is still to reduce inflammation and from you know, using preservative-free eye drops to all the way to blood biologics and everything in between, uh, you know, that we've seen in the DUCE2 algorithm would be appropriate to help reduce inflammation and optimize the ocular surface as much as we can. And of course, we can also use uh, pain medications and work with, um, you know, other disciplinaries to help manage um, neuropathic pain in these patients. That's it, you guys. That was a summary of uh, blood biologics that uh, I had. Uh, please feel free to connect with us.